Oh, gosh. Well, thanks so much for this warm welcome. Um, I, have a, I have a new book out that I'm going to talk with you about. But first, I want to just share with you a little bit about what brought me to write this book. And um, I think I have the funnest job in the world. I get to meet some of the, the, the greatest friends, like this cheetah who I met in Namibia when I was working with Dr. Lori Marker, a, a fabulous woman who wanted to be a vintner, ended up making some money so she could be a vintner by working at a wildlife park, bred cheetahs for like the first time successfully in captivity in, in a gazillion years, found out that they were endangered and that no one was doing anything. So she sold everything she had and moved to Africa to change that. So I get to meet people and animals like this. I get to swim with pink dolphins. Pink dolphins are not like the um, pink elephants you might have seen after too many martinis. They, they are actually real creatures. They live in the Amazon and Orinoco Aron rivers, but they are magical. And the people of the Amazon will tell you that they will change into human form, that they'll come up out of the water and they'll appear at dances. They'll be a handsome stranger. Of course, he'll be wearing a hat to cover the blowhole. <laughs> but of course, you will fall in love and take him home. And he'll give you a beautiful necklace. Or if it was a woman, maybe she'll give you a, a lovely golden watch. But then in the morning, you'll wake up and find that your lover is gone and where the watch was, or the bracelet or necklace, is a pile of little silvery fish, because he will have turned back into a pink dolphin. So I get to meet creatures like this in my work. And this darling little watermelon of a guy, this is a baby <laughs> tapir. Aren't they the cutest things? And then they grow up to look like this. <laughs> And you know what this one's name is? It's named Sai. Isn't she glamorous? <laughs> She's in her glamorous swimwear. Um, she has a radio collar. She lives in the Pantanal in Brazil. I was doing a, a, a book with Dr. Uh, Patty Medici, and uh, she named a tapir after me, and Sai is doing just fine. She's fat and sleek and has lots of babies, unlike me. And in my work, I've gotten to know invertebrates as well, including octopuses. There is an octopus named Sai also. Well, was. She, she passed away. They don't live long enough. Um, but in all of these cases, with all of these animals, I've fallen in love again and again and again. And every one of my books is really a love story. I get to travel all over the world. Here I am, actually kind of lost in the Gobi. Um, thank goodness I was with a photographer who took this, this picture, Nick Bishop. What I was doing there was looking for traces of this animal. It's a snow leopard. You wouldn't think that the snow leopards live in the Gobi, but the Gobi is actually a stony desert, not a sandy desert as well. And this is where these beautiful endangered creatures live. But I've also had the enormous pleasure of working with tigers and a particular tiger population that very few people know about. These are the tigers who live in a mangrove swamp known as Shunderman. Now, a lot of people don't realize that tigers swim, but in Shunderman, they actually swim out after your boat like a dog chases a car, and they get on board and they eat you. <laughs> and this happens hundreds of times a year. It's the only place in the world where healthy tigers routinely hunt and eat people. So naturally, I wanted to go there. <laughs> but I told my husband not to worry, honey, they are man-eaters. 
and the women stay home where they can be eaten by crocodiles. Actually, this, this was an inc incredible um, series of, of journeys that I made, and I learned so much from the local people. They had a fantastic understanding of the natural history of these, these animals, but it was encoded in their stories, in their myths, which had been just completely dismissed as silly superstition. But happily, by getting to know these people, I came to understand that it reflected deep wisdom as well as natural history intelligence. Now, I want to show you a picture of one of my teachers. This is um, Walt Clarkson, who was my journalism teacher. And teachers, are there any teachers tonight in the, in the audience? You are my heroes. I live my life by a kind of maxim that goes like this. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And Walt Clarkson was right there for me in my second high school when I needed to develop my journalism skills. But here's the thing about teachers. They don't always have two legs. And sometimes when they do, they also have a bill and wings. Teachers come in all forms, and sometimes they have four legs, sometimes they have six legs, they might have eight legs, or eight arms, or they might not have any legs at all. But the thing about teachers is when you're ready, they come to you, and your job is to recognize that they are teachers and to listen for their truth whether they are human or not human. And for me, so many of my teachers have been animals. From the point I was a very little kid. Well, in all of my books, and I think there's like 27 of them now, um, I've gotten to learn the wisdom of, of many teachers, of native people, of scientists, of creatures like this beautiful anaconda. Um, and I had the privilege of being um, interviewed and on this kind of show with a friend of mine whose work you may know, Vicki Croak. Does anyone know her, her work? She um, wrote a wonderful book called Elephant Company a few years ago. And, and she had this like podcast thing that you see on your computer somehow. And uh, came to the house. <laughs> People have been so patient with me. I don't even have like one of those folding computer things. I don't have one of those phones that's a, that's a real camera. I have like a rock and a stick is what I have, and I live in New Hampshire. But anyway, um, she, she came to do one of these things that you can see on your computer and uh, interviewed me about some of these teachers that I've known through the years. And I told her some of the great natural history facts, told them why I love them so. And one reason is that native people have recognized that animals are teachers for millennia. And the bear is one of those that Native Americans, for example, across many of their nations are universally recognized as the original medicine man or medicine woman who taught humankind how to use plant medicine. Now, it sounds like a silly little superstition. Oh, isn't that cute about the bear teaching the people? But it turns out it's based on real natural history knowledge. Bears do use plants as medicine. And we now know that there are lots of different organisms, including insects, that use plants as medicine. And if you are a careful observer of, of natural history and what these animals are doing, you too can learn useful medicines. And one of the medicines that people learned to use from animals is aspirin. And here's a story about a bear. Um, I, I, you can read stories like this in the literature of explorers and stuff all the time. This was about a bear that was methodically stripping the bark from a willow tree as a hunter watched. And he wondered, what is, is that animal doing? Willow tree bark has no nutrition. It's bitter. He shot the bear. Once he shot the bear, he opened its mouth, which is actually, you, 
you wouldn't want to do that if you hadn't either shot the bear with a dart gun or a, a bullet, but opened the bear's mouth and saw that the willow bark had all been chewed up and made into like one big wad of stuff, and it was around one tooth in the bear's mouth. The hunter pushed it away from that spot and saw that that tooth was embedded in a piece of the gum that was terribly abscessed and infected. Well, what do you think that willow bark was doing? It's the source of salicylic acid, which is why aspirin reduces inflammation, reduces pain. And that bear was using the willow bark the same way Native Americans know to use willow bark tea. So animals have so much to teach us. And I was talking about this with my friend Vicki when she came over to record this segment for her podcast. She knows well that animals have senses that we don't. Henry Beston in The Outermost House wrote about this. He said that the animal should not be measured by man because they are living by voices that we can never hear. And they're gifted with extensions of senses that we have lost or never attained. Well, elephants are one of those animals who, just in the 1980s, scientists learned are able to use sounds below the threshold of human hearing to communicate with one another across vast distances. This is called infrasound. And this is how a herd of elephants who's being poached over here can communicate miles away their distress to another herd of elephants over there. People had wondered about this for a very long time. And in the 1980s, it was uh, Catherine Payne, Katie Payne, along with Elizabeth Marshall Thomas, who happens to be my best friend, and Bill Langbauer, who published the paper establishing the fact that infrasound was real. But lots of animals have these senses that we have lost or never attained. For example, sharks. This is a beautiful great white shark who I met while diving in a shark cage off Guadalupe Island. They have what look like cute little freckles on their face. If you get close enough, you'll see on their snout these, these dark dots. And what they are are sense organs called the ampullae of Lorenzini, with which they can sense the electrical current of the heartbeat of their prey. So as I hung in that cage, that shark could sense my heartbeat. So animals know so much that we do not. And Vicki and I were discussing this for her show when she asked, well, it's obvious that you've learned a lot about animals' lives. Have animals ever taught you anything about your life? And I said, yes. They've taught me how to be a good creature. And that's how this book started. An editor at Houghton Mifflin, one of the publishers that I've been privileged to work with, happened to see the video that was archived online and called me up and she said, that has to be your next book. And it's a memoir in 13 animals. It's an homage, it's my thanks to these 13 individuals who have helped me through every difficulty that I have ever faced who have shown me my destiny, who have shown me how to make a family, who have shown me the path to forgiveness, who have shown me how to fall in love with the world again and again every day. And some of these animals have literally saved my life. And I'd like to introduce you to some of them tonight. And the first on the right is my beloved Molly. She was a Scottish terrier, and we were pups together. When I was, I should probably tell you that around the time I was two, something bad happened to me. And um, my, I stopped growing, I stopped speaking, I stopped moving around. 
Um, I probably had brain damage. There was no record in my army records of what happened, but my aunt is, um, has told me that I was sh shaken, probably. Well, my parents didn't like this because you can't have a child who's not growing and speaking and it's embarrassing, so they tried everything to try to fix it. Finally, they got me a puppy. Well, this was great because ever since I was a little kid, well, I started out as a little, little kid, pre-speaking, I managed to communicate the fact that I was actually a horse. My mother was very distressed by this, took me to the pediatrician, who assured her that I would outgrow that face, and I did, when I then discovered that I was a dog and announced this. Well, my problem as a child growing up was that while there were many people eager to show me how to be a little girl, there was nobody who could show me how to be a dog until Molly showed up. And as you can see, this little person standing next to her is absolutely in love. And I began to speak and run around and grow. And it's all because of her. But that was just the start of how she saved my life. She saved my life in another way as well. And that is, she gave me what every little girl wants, and that is an older sister. We all worship our older sisters. We all want to be our older sisters. And I wanted to be my older sister because my older sister was a dog. <laughs> and I dreamed of going to live in the woods with Molly. I realized, you know, after her puppyhood was very short, my puppyhood was very long, I recognized that she was not my baby. She was actually a mature adult when I was still a child. I looked up to her, and she had all these great powers that I didn't have. She could hear things far above and below my threshold of hearing. She could see in the dark. You know, dogs have that tapidum lucidum in the eye, that light gathering little mirror in the eye that lets them hunt at night. She could smell a whole world of wonderful things. This is the picture I keep on my desk to this day of Molly. And one day, I was going to run away with Molly and live in the woods. And thanks to her, I would learn the secrets of the wild animals everywhere. And this is what I did. I don't live in a hollow tree in the woods. But this is what I do for a living. I am following in her footsteps. She showed me the way. She showed me my destiny. So I'm so grateful to her as my, my first greatest teacher. But I've had other teachers as well. And um, one along the way is thus, can you know what this is? This is the southern hairy-nosed wombat. How can you not love a face like this? The southern hairy-nosed wombat, as you know, wombats live in Australia. Australia is full of cool marsupials, little animals with belly pockets. And after I had um, graduated from college and I'd worked for five years at a newspaper in New Jersey, my father, ever my, my hero, gave me the gift of a ticket to fly to Australia and get to see some of these animals. But I didn't want to just journey as a tourist, so I joined this organization called Earthwatch. And if you go on earthwatch.com, you will see that they have all kinds of like great um, digs and studies that you can join as a paying layman for just the right amount of time for your vacation, just a couple of weeks, and they're all around the world. And by the way, the minute you leave your house till the minute you go home, it's all a tax write-off because it's charity. So I joined Earthwatch to go work for Dr. Pamela Parker studying the beautiful southern hairy-nosed wombat in South Australia. And I fell madly in love with the field work, madly in love with the landscape, madly in love with the wombats. So after two weeks, it's time to go home. And even though I'm going home to my beloved now husband, and my beloved ferrets, and my lovebirds, and my friends, and my parents, I was weeping 
to leave South Australia and this, this great place where we would camp every night smelling the eucalypt um, smoke in our hair and wake in the morning to see a dawn streaked with parrots. And Dr. Parker said to me, I see how much you love it here and you've been a great worker and I wish I could hire you to work for me. I wish I could give you a ticket to just come back here. But I, I don't have that kind of funding. She said, but if you ever want to study anything in, in this research park, I will let you eat the food in my camp and you can stay in my camp. So I instantly went home and quit my job and moved to a tent in the outback and studied these animals. <laughs> these are emus. They stand beside the kangaroo and the coat of arms of Australia as symbols of this otherworldly continent with all these cool animals. Now, not much was known about them, though, oddly. No one knew, for, inst for instance, what they do all day. <laughs> so. I got to find it out. And what I did was I apprenticed myself to these, these three emus, and I just followed them around all day. <laughs> and they, they let me. Now, they can run 40 miles an hour, and that's when they could lose me. But most of the time, they would let me. I mean, I, I had to habituate them to get them used to me. But fortunately, I wore the same thing every day. Um, I, I wore my father's army jacket and a red kerchief. They have excellent color vision. They knew who I was right away. Oh, there's that harmless person. And I became part of their group, running around, just writing down everything they did. It, it was kind of like being Jane Goodall of emus. <laughs> but, you know, Jane was a heroine of mine growing up. Of course, before I could even read, I was looking at pictures of her. She went into the field in Tanzania in 1960 holding her hand out to a chimpanzee as an equal. And this is how I felt with the animals that I was now studying. If anything, we weren't equals. If anything, they were my superiors. They were my teachers. I was the disciple. And I just wanted them to show me their lives. And they didn't show me that they were doing you know, tool use, or making stock trades. They did show me some surprising things, like their great sense of humor. They would tease the ranger's dog, for instance. They knew exactly how long the chain was for the dog. And these tall birds would walk up to just the very edge of the length of that chain, and the dog would run, 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 and then hit the end of the chain and bounce back, and the emus would would splash the air with their feet, and their little stumpy eight-inch wing stumps would wiggle around, and they'd throw their heads and necks up. The dog's going crazy. And they would do this until they thought they had enough, and then they would just walk a little over this way and sit down and preen. <laughs> the dog would go nuts. Anyway, these birds, they, they were so fascinating. They're so wonderful. And taught me so much. They taught me so much about what they did, what their lives were like. But the most important thing that they showed me, they showed me the path that I would take to fulfill the destiny that I had imagined thanks to my first teacher, Molly. I realized that after six months of living in a tent in the outback that I was not going to be able to go back to the newsroom and struggle into pantyhose and work for somebody else. I realized that I was now on a path to travel the world, learn the secrets of the animals, and so what if everyone told me I was crazy? And the other thing that they showed me that I've used for every single book I've ever written is something that Jane Goodall and her scientific sisters, Diane Fossey and Barute Galdikas, and so many other scientists have learned. And that is that, of course, when you want to study and learn about an animal or any, any creature or person or discipline that fascinates you, that, of course, you need your intellect, but also you need your intuition, and you need your emotion. 
And I found that the most revealing tool of inquiry that I could use in my work was having a relationship with my study animals and getting to know them and respect them as unique individuals who could be teachers. And I have carried that throughout my life to every single book I have done and every animal that I have met. Especially, I think, Christopher Hogwood. I'm delighted to introduce you to Christopher, who was a tiny piglet who came home in a shoebox on my lap. But as soon as we wormed him, he began to grow and soon <laughs> attained true gravitas. He grew to 750 pounds. We didn't have any idea how big he was going to get. We did not know how to raise a pig. Um, we didn't know what we were doing, but he showed us. And he showed me so much more. Christopher Hogwood is in this book because he is the one who showed me how to make a family. Now, I should tell you that growing up as a child, um, my father was an army general. He was a World War II hero, and I adored him. However, if you are the general's daughter, no one on the base will play with you because if you conquer over the head with your toy truck, your dad will be peeling potatoes for the rest of his life. So I didn't have children as friends as a child, and I had no idea how much fun they were. But Christopher Hogwood taught me, and he's the one who brought children into my life, loads of them. Because the minute you've got a pig in your yard, kids are running over to have pig spa. And we would wash him with warm, soapy water, and we would put the hoof maker on his hooves, and we would braid his, the hair on his tail. It was great. And we would feed him chocolate donuts, and we would eat chocolate donuts. It was a fabulous, fabulous situation. He taught me how much fun children are. And although my husband and I didn't have any children of our own, very soon there were lots of children in our lives. Now, I did not exactly have a uh, picture-perfect family. As you know, as you'll remember from the beginning of, of my talk, my mother and I, she wasn't always thrilled that I was her daughter. I mean... I, I can imagine it was very frustrating. She would tell me, even when I, I was into my 20s and 30s, how irritating it was to have this howling baby screaming during the cocktail hour. And um, she had her own ideas of what I should do and be. And one of those ideas is that I should do as she did and marry some great army guy, because she'd done great marrying my dad. But I did not marry an army guy. And when I married a not army guy who was a different religion and who is the love of my life to this moment, Howard Mansfield, who is an author, who's got a great book out today, call 1-800 and order. Anyway, um, <laughs> my, my parents disowned me. This is about the time that Christopher Hogwood came into my life. Now, Christopher Hogwood was delighted that he was um, living in a family that included a Jew and a vegetarian. <laughs> if you're a pig, that's who you want to live with. <laughs> he was totally happy to overlook the fact that I lacked a flexible nose disc and curly tail. He was willing to forgive me for who I was. My parents could not, but he could. And he showed me that a family isn't made out of blood. I'm not genetically related to him any more than, you know, we share 90% of our genetic material with all mammals. We share 40% of our genetic material with a banana. So, <laughs> but family isn't made out of genetic material. It's not made out of blood. It's made out of love. And because of Christopher Hogwood, I had a family with 
chickens and pigs and dogs and cats and children to who, the, that I was not related to. I had a great family made out of love, and it was the family that I chose. He was a great big Buddha master, that pig. Well, I want to introduce you to yet another teacher. And this ermin, which is the white-coated winter version of a weasel, tiny little animals. You know, weasels can, can weigh, there's several different species that we have in New Hampshire. The smallest weighs just about as much as a handful of coins. But they're very brave, and they can take down prey much larger than themselves. They are fearless. Well, this ermine made a huge difference in my life, and I only knew this ermine for a matter of minutes. But that's the case with teachers. Sometimes you'll know them for a lifetime, but sometimes just a very brief encounter with a great teacher can change your life, and that's the case with the sermon. I met the sermon on Christmas morning. I went out with a big bowl of buttered popcorn, as I do every Christmas, to share with my hens. I raise my chickens from tiny little chicks. They arrive in the mail, two days old, and they live in, in my office growing up in, the, in my office. They recognize me. I recognize them, of course, individually. They, whenever you get out of your car, when you come home, the chickens just mob you like you're the Beatles. They make you feel great. <laughs> so I just want you to know how much I loved these hens. I call them the ladies, collectively. And so on this Christmas morning, I come bearing their Christmas present, and I open the door to the coop, and one of my ladies is dead on the floor. And I go to pick her up by her scaly yellow legs. Her head is like wedged into a hole in the corner, and I can't pick her up. So what is going on? And I pull, and I pull, and I finally pull her free. I step back, and out from a hole in the corner pops this white head with a little bit of blood on the chin. And with these dark eyes, blazing like coals. This tiny animal looks at me, a monster, 120 pounds and five foot five, as if to say, give me back my chicken or else. <laughs> completely unafraid of me. This thing is completely fierce. Tiny little creature, and yet it's as if all the wildness of lions and tigers and bears and wolverines have been packed into this tiny package. And I could not feel any anger towards that beautiful, courageous, gorgeous creature, incandescent in its ferocity. And at that moment, I realized how much I loved my mother, who had died earlier that year. And I forgave her for all the bad things that happened between us. And I realized how much she was like that ermine. She was a little woman. She had grown up poor in Arkansas. And yet, despite being poor in a rural area and a woman, she'd gone to college, become valedictorian, learned to fly a plane, landed a job with the FBI, and married herself a bird colonel who later became a general. And this poor woman then got to live all over the world with a staff car to whisk her and her husband wherever they wanted to go, and with orderlies that would clean her house and cooks that would carve meats at her dinner parties. She had a wonderful life because of her ferocious, fearless determination. And I realized you know, my dad had been my hero growing up. He was a survivor of the Bataan Death March. He had been a survivor of Japanese prison camp. I thought I got my courage and determination from him. But I realized when I saw this ermine that I owed my mother as well for the knowledge 
that if it can be done by a person, it can be done by me. I felt no anger towards this beautiful animal. And this beautiful animal, in a matter of minutes, showed me the path to forgiveness. So teachers are around us always. I've been lucky enough to travel to Papua New Guinea, to the cloud forest, to study tree kangaroos that seem like impossible creatures that Dr. Seuss, if he was collaborating with Dakin Toys while on an acid trip, would have created some of these animals. These are real kangaroos. They, they climb up into the trees, 30 meters into the trees, if they feel like it, they then just jump down and boing away. You would not believe it. They're the most amazing. And look how adorable with these pink noses and unbelievable. These creatures also saved my life. And in the book, I tell you how I fell back in love with this world at a time when I had horrendous depression. I actually was so depressed that for months, the only thing that cheered me up was the prospect that I could kill myself. Um, I had lost Christopher to old age. He died in his sleep at age 14. I had lost my beloved Border Collie at age 16. I was writing the book, The Good Good Pig, which killed me to write. It was a memoir of my life with Christopher, but it was so hard to write because every day I'd get up and have to write this long chronicle of everything that I had lost. I was miserable. My hair was falling out. My gums were bleeding. My memory was shot. I couldn't think straight. And I figured, you know, this is going on for months and months, and if this doesn't stop, I had a, I had a plan to suicide. But I, I do what I say I'm going to do, and I do it on time. So I said I would write that, that book, The Good Good Pig, to honor Chris, and I had made a promise to write a book about the lady who studies these tree kangaroos, Dr. Lisa Daybeck. And this entailed what I believe would be my last trip to um, this amazing place. It's like Eden if Eden had leeches that sometimes get in your eyes. Um, it, the cloud forest of Papua New Guinea, other than the leeches, which are in a bit of a concern, um, other than the leeches, there's really nothing that can happen to you there. There's not a lot of mosquitoes. To, there's no malaria up there. Um, there's no poisonous snakes. Just these cute, furry animals that you just can't believe. Well, it was meeting two tree kangaroos who Dr. Daybeck named Christopher and Tess that brought me back from the abyss. So my animal teachers have brought me pretty much everything. And one of the most wonderful teachers I've had has, has been an octopus. Some of you may know a book I wrote, um, The Soul of an Octopus, which came out in 2015. In this book, I got to get to know octopuses as individuals. I got to know the minds of mollusks. These guys are mollusks, like clams, like snails. And we don't think of them as having my, uh, minds or souls. But getting to know them and particularly Octavia, I can tell you that if I have a soul, she had a soul. Let me just tell you what it's like to meet an octopus. I'll tell you about my first meeting with the first octopus I ever met. Her name was Athena. She, if she stood up, she would have been maybe four feet tall. She weighed 40 pounds. And Scott Dowd, who worked in, um, not in Cold Marine where she lived, but down the hall because the regular guy wasn't there. He lifts up the lid to the tank. Octopuses need lids on their tanks because otherwise they'll get out and they will do stuff you don't want. They'll like dial Japan and leave the thing off the hook. No, ac <laughs> they actually, 
they, they will get out of their tank and get into other tanks, eat everybody in there, and then go back to their tank. They are so smart. But anyway, I'm, I'm meeting Athena for the first time. He lifts up the lid of the tank. I see this beautiful animal turn bright red in front of me. She's red with excitement and emotion. I see her eyes swivel in its socket and lock onto mine. And suddenly she starts to, to ooze over from her lair, come out of her lair and come toward me. And the next thing I know, her arms are boiling up out of the freezing cold water and my arms are going in there to meet hers. And my hands and arms are covered with dozens of her silky soft white suckers. And she is touching me and tasting me at the same time. And I realize when I go home, I'm going to have to tell my husband why I got those hickeys at the aquarium. <laughs> But what was so obvious to me and so thrilling was here was an animal who is so distantly related to humans. You'd have to go back half a billion years to find a common ancestor. And that common ancestor, by the way, would just be a tube because nobody had eyes or hearts or anything complex then. Everybody was a tube back then. Um, <laughs> here's this animal who is so unlike us, you would have to go into science fiction or go to outer space to find somebody that unlike a human. And yet, that creature was just as interested in me as I was in her, just as curious. And we now know from scientific experiments that octopuses do, in fact, recognize individual human faces, and they have preferences for some humans, and they have memories that last a long time. And I experienced this myself with my dear Octavia, and I write about her as well. Octavia I met shortly after she came as a wild octopus to live at New England Aquarium in Boston. And at first she didn't want to have anything to do with us. But slowly I got to know her. Um, they, the way you get to know an octopus, they like to be stroked. They also like to be fed. Um, where is their mouth, you might ask. The mouth is conveniently located in the armpits, right there, where they have a beak like a parrot and venom like a snake and can shoot out ink like an old-fashioned pen. And these animals can change, as you know, color and shape. And I could see from when I got to know Athena and then Octavia, I could see different emotions on the skin of my friend. When they're excited, they're bright red. And then when you pet them, they start to turn white, which is the color of a calm and relaxed octopus. And they love to play with you. They love to play with the same toys our children do, like Legos and Mr. Potato Head. Well, I got to know Octavia so well that when one week I, I couldn't come, actually it was like two weeks, I couldn't come to the aquarium. And when I came back after that, we literally flew into each other's arms. We, were, we missed each other. It was really obvious. Other people saw this too. Um, we were very good friends. But octopuses only live three to five years. And by the time you meet them, they're already a year or two old. Well. Octavia was nearing the end of her life when she, like all female octopuses who live long enough, laid eggs. Here they are, hanging like strings of pearls. And this marked a huge change in our relationship because all octopuses, when, they, when the females lay eggs, they retreat to their den and they never come out again. They will not leave those eggs. They are cleaning their eggs. They're protecting their eggs. They're fluffing their eggs. They're using their siphon to hose down the eggs. They're using their arms. It looks like a woman vacuuming curtains. Um, she's all about her eggs. Now, Octavia could not know that her eggs were infertile. There was no Mr. Octopus, which was the problem. So month after month, she guarded those eggs. Now, a giant Pacific octopus in the wild, her eggs will hatch in about six months, depending 
on the water temperature. Well, six months went by, and she's still guarding the eggs. Seven months, eight months, nine months went by, and she was still steadfastly guarding these eggs, which are never going to hatch and are now beginning to disintegrate. And one day I noticed that she began to disintegrate too. She had a big swollen eye and infection, and Bill Murphy, who's the uh, cold marine senior aquarius, decided she should be moved behind the scenes. She should not have to be on display during this time. Because in the wild, at the end of their lives, they, they hide in their dens till they die. They use their last breath to blow the tiny baby octopuses out of these little eggs, each the size of a grain of rice, out of their eggs and into the open ocean. So he had to move her. Well, how do you move a giant Pacific octopus who's glued to her eggs? Well, remember, she'd been in her lair for more than nine months. Well, when Bill put his hand under her lair and touched her and she tasted him again, she recognized him and let him move her to a, a bucket and from the bucket to a place behind the scenes. And the next week I came in essentially to say goodbye to my friend. And I wondered, you know, it had been months and months since she'd looked up through the water at me. Would she remember me? Remember, they only lived three to five years. So <laughs> nine or ten months to an animal like that is decades. Would she even recognize me? And since she was old and sick, would she even feel like hanging out with me? Well, I was shocked and deeply moved to see that when I took the lid off her new exhibit, she floated immediately to the top and reached out and held me. And I offered her a fish, but she didn't want the fish. She just dropped it. She just wanted to be with me one last time. And the lesson I think that Octavia has taught me is one that's true of all the animals that you can get to know, all of the teachers that are around us all the time. And this, I think, was best said, it's attributed anyway, to Thales of Miletus, a pre-Socratic Greek philosopher who said that the universe is alive and has fire in it and is full of gods. And what I think that means the universe is alive, that there are so many lives around us, vivid, incandescent lives that, that love being on this earth, that love their lives like we love ours. The universe is alive and has fire in it and is full of gods. To me, that says the universe is far more holy far more worthy of our love, far more sacred than we might dare imagine. Our teachers are all around us to remind us of that daily and remind us that this earth is a holy place, a living place, and we owe it our reverence our thanks, and our awe. Thank you. <laughs>